God's house. Open, if you would, to 1 Timothy 6. We want to finish up our study of 1 Timothy tonight. Come down to the very end of this epistle. 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> thankful that each of you are here, and uh, we're thankful for those of you that are visiting with us tonight. Trust you'd feel welcome. Enjoy your time here. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Before we read, would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we need you tonight. I pray that as we look into your word that you would teach us by your sweet Holy Spirit. We know that your Spirit's the one that, uh, that uh, breathed the very words that these men penned down. And so there's no one better that could teach us than the one who wrote it. And Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, as we finish up this study that we would remember that, that we've learned that your work in your church is a very, very, very important uh, organism here upon this earth and that uh, as your people that we would uh, walk in a way that would please you and uh, that as a church that we would do things decently and in order we would follow the instructions that you've given us we'd be bold in our faith and courageous in you and Father we ask this all in Jesus name Amen Last week we studied verses 3, to, three through 10 which was a section uh, dealing with the false teachers and some of the things that they were involved in and there were several C's that uh, Paul mentioned and uh, the first one was confusion when uh, those that would come in in verse 3 and teach things that would be contrary to the to the words of Jesus Christ that would cause confusion and then that he spoke about contentment and certainly the need of of us to be content in what the Lord has done for us and then we talked about contentment and complacency and those two things are certainly opposites we don't need to be complacent, we need to be content. And then he dealt with covetousness, and uh, that's where we left off. And uh, talked about those that desire to be rich, and it's going to lead, lead to a lot of problems and a lot of trouble in their lives if that's their uh, number one uh, goal in life, is to acquire great wealth. So tonight we want to, like I said, we want to finish up, beginning in verse 11, and uh, the last verse is verse 21 in this chapter. And uh, if you want to just look at it this way, as far as I can tell, that these are sort of the final exhortations that Paul has, is giving Timothy here in this epistle. He's just wrapping it up. And uh, there's not a lot of new doctrine in this. Uh, really, it's, it's just to, to spur Timothy on, to encourage him, and uh, to, uh, to, to help him to, to be very strong and courageous in the Lord's work, he's going to remind him of some things, even the Lord's calling upon his life. So let's, let's just go ahead and read it, and then we'll go back through and, and look at it uh, verse by verse. Beginning in verse 11. Remember, this is Paul writing to Timothy. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto whom no man hath seen nor can see To whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches But in the living God who giveth richly giveth us richly all things to enjoy That they do good that they be rich in good works ready to distribute willing to communicate Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace with thee, grace be with thee, amen. The first to Timothy was written from Laodicea, which was the chiefest city of Phrygia, uh, Pacatiana. I don't know if I pronounced that last word correctly. Let's go back to uh, verse 11, and uh, as I said, that these are just the final, the final words, the final exhortations to Timothy. There's some good stuff here. 
And so I don't want you to think that, well, it's just uh, a wrap-up, a conclusion. And so there's not really anything I can learn tonight. But to begin in verse 7, and he says, but thou, but you. He, it's a very, a very personal tone now. Remember, this is Paul the aged to Timothy the young preacher. This is Paul uh, the, 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 the writing to his own beloved son in the faith. And so he says, but thou, and I want you to notice what Paul calls him here. He doesn't call him a young preacher. He doesn't call him uh, a, a greenhorn. He doesn't call him, you know, you wet behind the ears, uh, whippersnapper. He says, but you, O oh man of God. When's the last time that you heard the, uh, uh, the a minister referred to as the man of God? I can remember maybe in, in times past, years ago, I heard that a little more than I do today. But Paul's reminding Timothy that he is a man of God. He is God's man. God has chosen him. Uh, God has called him into the ministry. God has equipped him for the work that he has for him to do. And for Timothy, this must have been something very encouraging because Timothy, they didn't have the New Testament scriptures, but they had the Old Testament scriptures. And when you go back into the Old Testament, and uh, there are several individuals that are referred to in the Old Testament as men of God. And they were men such as Moses, Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, Daniel, some of the great men, the great, uh, gr great men of faith in the Old Testament were referred to as men of God. And for Timothy, one who evidently was a little timid, a little shy, lacked some self-confidence, and I don't mean self-confidence in a good way, but in a lot of ways he felt inferior. We've already dealt with that. For him, for Paul to, to remind him that you are a man of God. No doubt was something that was very strengthening and encouraging to him. So he says, but thou, O man of God, he says, here's is what you are to do. And last week there were a lot of C's and tonight there's a lot of uh, F's, words that begin with F. And uh, the first thing that Paul told Timothy here was to flee, to flee some things. F-L-E, to get away. When I think about fleeing something that... Uh, I don't think about just looking up, look, going up to something and just sort of casually walking away. To flee something, remember he said flee fornication. Uh, I believe that's something you need to turn and run from because it's dangerous. And so he said flee these things. What things? Well, those things that he's just talked about, the love of money, uh, covetousness, false doctrine. He said you need to flee all of these things. You need to get away from them. These things don't need to be a part of your life. Because he said, these things are dangerous. These things will ruin you. These things will bring you down. So he says, flee these things. So the first F is to flee. There's a lot of things we need to flee, aren't there? A lot of things we need to get away from, run from. However, if all you ever do is run from the bad, is that going to get you where you need to be? It's not, is it? But Clay, you need to run from the bad, but you need to pursue or long for to, to go after that which is good. Not just to, to, to put aside the evil. So he says, flee these things, but then he says, follow after. And the, word, the, the phrase follow after here means to give chase, to pursue it, to set as your goal. Uh, I always think about... Uh, the, the, the Dukes of Hazard. Uh, Roscoe was always in hot pursuit, wasn't he? If you remember that show? I'm in hot pursuit, you know? And uh, he was going after the Duke boys. He was going to get them. That was his goal, to, to catch them. And so that, that Paul tells Timothy here, you need to be in hot pursuit of these things. You need to, with all your might, diligently, you need to pursue these things. And here's what he told him to pursue. After he told him to flee these other things, he said... Follow after, pursue, number one, righteousness. Now, you say, well, this is just for a preacher. It's good for all the children of God to, to, to have this as your goal. Righteousness means right living. He's not talking about the positional righteousness that we find in Jesus Christ because Timothy was already saved. But he's talking about doing that which is right. Not only to do right in the sight of God, but to do right in your dealings with men. To, to live a, an upright, upstanding life. So he said, pursue, number one, righteousness. And then the second thing he said to pursue was godliness. To pursue godliness. He said, what's the difference in righteousness and, and godliness? Well, they're, they're very similar. Uh, but uh, godliness is simply, is, is that conformance to the, to the image 
of God and to the mind of Christ. Now we know that the good shepherd, Psalm 23, we find that Jesus, that the, the Lord is my shepherd and he leads me in the paths of righteousness. So we follow him on the paths of righteousness and then you think about godliness here, to have that mind of Christ, to be conformed, transformed to the image of Christ. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That glass, that mirrors the Word of God. And so that as God's people, as we spend time in the Word of God, as we spend time beholding Christ, He said we're changed into that same image. So He said follow after righteousness. The second thing He said to pursue after was godliness. The third thing, I'm just going to run through these quickly. The third one is faith. It's faith. We all need more faith. Lord, increase our faith. There's not one of us here that have the faith that we need to have in God. That's complete and total confidence where we're trusting Him with all of our heart and we're not leaning to our own understanding. Uh, and, and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Uh, as, as we see how, how that God was faithful to His Word, we, we sung a song a minute ago about the unchanging hand of God. and He is that unchanging. It says time is, uh, time is changing and things are, are changing, but it says that God is unchanging. He's immutable. And that's what the word immutable means, that He changes not. So we're to pursue after faith, to have a greater faith, to have greater confidence uh, and total obedience in the Lord. And then the fourth thing he mentioned here to pursue after was love. To pursue after love. This love here is, is remember there's many different Greek words for love in the New Testament, but this one is agape love. This is the love of Christ. This is loving those you don't like. It's not only loving God, but it's loving one another. It's loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's loving your family. Uh, it's loving your neighbors. Uh, it's loving your enemies. To come to that place to love. How many of you love your enemies? Yeah, I didn't raise my hand either. And I think we all, to an extent, we know we're supposed to love our enemies. And, and, and I think we love them to a point, don't we? There's, there's not a soul in the world that I don't want to see get saved. And that's love. But it's hard to love your enemy as you love yourself. It's hard to love your enemy as you love your family, your children, those that are kind to you. And so he says here to pursue after love. The next thing he said was to pursue, pursue after is patience. And remember, patience in the Bible usually doesn't mean just waiting, even though that we do have need of patience. He, he wrote that to the Hebrew people in Hebrews chapter 10. You have need of patience. And patience here means cheerful endurance. It means to bear up under trouble and trial and, and knowing that, this, that God's got a purpose and a plan for this that I'm going through. And then the last one here that's mentioned is that he is pursue is, is meekness. Um, Brother J.C.'s brother-in-law funeral was this week. And I can't remember exactly how the preacher put it in the funeral, but he was talking about that his brother-in-law was a meek man. And he used a... He used the example of a Clydesdale horse. You may have caught that, Brother J.C. You think about a Clydesdale horse, those things are huge. Uh, I don't know, there may be, lar there probably are larger horses. I'm not a horse person, so I'm not up on my horse breeds. But you think about how large they are, and yet when, when those horses, when the reins are put on them, that, and, and they submit themselves to that one who is leading them, that's meekness. That's what meekness is. It's strength under control. It's the ability to go and to do anything that I wanted to do, but I'm submitting myself under someone else's hand. And so he said that for the man of God, he is to pursue uh, meekness. And then he goes on to verse 12, and he sort of switches gears. See, I like these next few verses. They all tie together. The first word is fight. So now that he lets Timothy know or reminds him that you're in a war, because you don't go fight if you're not in a war, if you're not in a battle. Wars are to be fought. So he said, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Now we know that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And because of that, that we're to put on the whole armor of God. And uh, those things that Paul wrote, told us about there in the book of Ephesians. And so he says here that we're to, we're to fight, and it's a good fight. 
And he says it's a fight of faith. That doesn't mean that we're fighting just confidently that we, we feel like we're going to win. But the word faith there means the truth. That has been handed down. That has been given. The doctrines of the word of God. So he said fight the good fight of faith. You know what the best thing about fighting the good fight of faith is? We're assured to victory. I don't guess there's any other war that's ever been fought that, that the victory was assured as the victory is assured with us. Children of Israel versus Ai. Sure victory for the children of Israel, right? They lost that one. Uh, you think about some, even the wars that this country's fought. Uh, you think about it, even the Vietnam conflict. Uh, I tell you what, it, I, I respect and, and honor those men that went and fought in that because they were doing what their country called for them to do. But really, in a lot of ways, it was an unwinnable war because of the stipulations that were put on our, our soldiers by those in command. Uh, and so even though that we're fighting a very small country, that we didn't get the victory there. Yet that in the fight of faith, we're assured the victory. So fight the good fight of faith. So he's telling Timothy, you, you man up, you be that soldier. Flip over to 2 Timothy real quick, uh, verse, uh, chapter 2. I just want to read just two or three verses here concerning our fight. The fight of faith that we're in. He said in uh, verse, verse 3 of 2 Timothy 2, he says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I think that's one of the biggest things that causes us to individually to lose a lot of battles in our Christian warfare. And we're not going to lose the war because the war is not ours to lose. One day that, that Satan and the the beast and the false prophet is going to be cast into the lake of fire. A war is going to be won. But we get entangled with the affairs of this life too much. And it causes us to not be as successful as we ought to be in our, our battle. But you know what Paul said at the end of his life? He said, I fought a good fight. I fought, I fought the good fight. And so he tells Timothy back in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that you fight the good fight. I fought it. Now you fight it. We need to fight the good fight of faith. We don't need to be twinkle toes. We don't need to be those that are not willing to stand for anything. That we need to fight that good fight of faith. And then he said this, lay hold on eternal life. Now, that, that doesn't mean that, that Timothy had to work for salvation. As, as, again, as I said already, he was already saved. Lay hold on to means to, to grasp, to reach out and and to claim that new life, that, vic that victorious life that is made possible to us through Jesus Christ. It, it simply means this, that you make it clear by your life that you're a child of God. So fight the good fight of faith. You make it clear that you're a child of God. And notice he goes on, he said, whereunto thou art also called. He's still dealing with this military illustration. And he said that there was a time that you were enlisted. There were a time that you, was, that you were called into this fight. And that was way back in Lystra. You go back to the book of Acts chapter 16, I believe it is, where Paul went through Lystra and he found Timothy. Go back to the time when you trusted Christ, that you were called into this, into this warfare, into this fight, that you were enlisted. So he said that you lay hold on this eternal life whereto thou art called. And then he said, and you have professed a good profession before many witnesses. What's Paul talking about there? I think he's talking about his baptism. That Timothy, when he trusted Christ, that he professed that before men. And when he went down and he submitted himself to water baptism, uh, he was saying that I'm, I'm dying to self and I'm raising, being raised up to walk in newness of life. Uh, you think about even the, the, the statement that, that Paul made that I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave his life for me. And so that uh, he tells him here, he said that you've professed, you've, uh, you've committed publicly to fight this good fight of faith. That's always a good reminder to us to be reminded of what we've committed to do, isn't it? That's what this is for. That's why you wear it. 
I don't take mine off. I don't know if, when, I, when I first got married, I said, I'm going to take it off at night. I don't want to get it messed up. Let me tell you what I did. We got married over Christmas holidays because I was teaching. And uh, so we got back in 3rd or 4th of January whenever we went back to school. And uh, the first day back, I forgot to put my wedding band on before I went to work. I said, here I am, just got married. I don't even have my wedding band on. I don't take it off anymore. But that's what it's for, is a reminder. We made a commitment. So he said, you've made a commitment. You professed a good profession before many witnesses. Verse 13, I give thee charge. The word charge is a military term. It's an order. I give you charge or order in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Now he's just told him that you've professed a good profession way back yonder, and now he says, let me remind you of somebody else that professed a good profession. That was Jesus Christ. And when did he profess his good profession? He professed a good profession all through his life, didn't he? But he reminds us here of a particular time at the end of his life before Pontius Pilate that he witnessed a good confession or a good profession. I believe what Paul was, was, was encouraging Timothy to do, Brother Allen, is you profess a good profession all the way to your death, just as Christ did. He didn't just start, he continued, and he finished. He said, I charge you to do the same thing. Verse 14, that thou keep this commandment Notice the word this is a supplied word here. So if you take that word out, it's in italics. He said, that thou keep commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what commandments is he talking about? Well, he's given him a lot of things to, commanded a lot of things for him to keep. But what's the greatest commandment? You love the Lord your God with all of thy heart, thy soul, and thy mind, and you love thy neighbor as thyself. I believe that's what he's reminding Timothy of, that you keep the commandment. You keep the great commandment. All the other ones hang on those two. That you love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and then you love your neighbor as yourself. These are things that will, uh, will promote Timothy in, or promote the ministry that Timothy is in. And you do this, he said, without spot, and unrebukable. You make sure your life is lived in such a way that people can't place uh, blame upon your life. When? All the way. Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's saying that there is coming a time when Christ is coming back God's program is still right in line. It's still in order. It's still going to happen when it's supposed to happen. And he, he describes Christ here as the only potentate. What does the word potentate mean? Look at the first six letters. What do we call it if something is potent? What does that mean? Help me out. Strong. Ammonia. Potent smell, isn't it? Bleach. You think about things that are just, the, we say it, that's strong, that, that's potent. So a potentate is one who, is, who has ultimate strength. One who has great power. And so that Jesus, it said here, he's the only potentate. So what does that tell you about him? His power is greater than all the other potentates. He is the only potentate. King of kings. And Lord of Lords, and it describes in verse 16, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. That speaks of, uh, of his righteousness, uh, that he only hath immortality. We, we've, been, we've been given immortality through Christ, but he's the only one who has immortality. Whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now, it seemed like the book would be over. But then he gives a charge in verse, beginning in verse 17. This is important. Evidently, this was something that they needed to hear one more time. It needed to be emphasized. It's already, he's already spoken about it. But he said in verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world. So, this is to those who are wealthy. We 
this morning, uh, you know, preached about laid up treasures in heaven. That we, we do that by, uh, by giving of, of what we have down here to, uh, to, to help people. Not just to, you know, somebody that, not as the world looks at it, we look at it as, as doing what Christ would do. Because the Bible says, he that hath, uh, hath his goods and seeth his neighbor that is in trouble and shutteth up his bowels of compassion. He said, you know, how dwelleth the love of God in him. So he said, charge them that are rich in this world. Here's, what, here's the charge he's to give them. That they be not high-minded. Don't you think that would be hard if you were rich not to get arrogant, lifted up in pride? I think it would be. I, I don't know. I, I'm not rich. I'm not rich in the Lord, but I'm not rich in material things. But I can imagine that you would, it'd be easy to look down on others. But he charged them not to be high-minded. And here's another problem that would be very difficult if you were rich, and that is to trust in your money. Why is it so hard for a rich person to be saved? Because you've got to trust in something else besides your money. So charge them that are rich in this world, they be not high-minded, don't be arrogant, don't trust in uncertain riches. Remember those uncertain riches because moth doth corrupt, uh, moth and rust doth corrupt, and thieves break through and steal, so they're uncertain. They can be gone in a heartbeat. But trust in, in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Trust in Him. And then what are they to do? Verse 18, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. I could have read this this morning. I knew we were going to get to it tonight, so I, I left it out. But it's what I preached this morning. They, that they do good, be, be rich in, in good works and, and whatever it is that they can do to, to help those in need. Ready to distribute. To distribute means to hand out. Willing to communicate. Communicate means basically the same thing, to reach out to people. And notice what will happen if they'll do this. It says in verse 19, laying up in store. That phrase, laying up in store, means treasuring away. It literally means laying up treasures Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation when? Against the time to come. What well, we said this morning, that God, to, to, about Onesiphorus, God would have mercy upon him, that he would give alms back to him because Onesiphorus had been willing to sacrifice what he had for the, for, for the cause of Christ to help Paul, to help those that were in need. And so he said that uh, the same thing here. Those that have, if they'll do not like the rich man and tear down their barns and build greater so they can hoard it up for themselves, but if they'll, uh, if they'll be willing to distribute and communicate to others, he said they'd lay up for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they, they may lay hold on eternal life. Again, the same thing. Not that they'll, by doing good, that they'll be saved, but they'll really understand and grasp what it means to be saved. That there's a better life, there's a, there's a new life, the life of Christ, the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ. And then he goes back to Timothy, the last two verses. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Now, I want to ask you this question. What had been committed to Timothy's trust? The gospel. The truth, hasn't it? How many times have we seen that in this book? Over and over again. Contend for the faith. Contend for the truth. He said, keep that which is committed, that that's been given to you. And we are, we're ambassadors for Christ and the word of reconciliation has been committed unto us. We have that treasure, the, the scripture says, in earthen vessels. Keep that that's committed to thy trust. Avoid profane. Remember the word profane means that that's uh, of this world. That that's not of God. It's, it's worthless. Avoid profane and vain babblings. He said, there's just some things that you don't, don't need to get involved in. Avoid profane and vain babblings. And there's a lot that could be put in that category. He said, just don't get caught up in things that are empty, that are worthless. And oppositions of science, falsely so-called. I've read this all my life, and I had to really dig, try to get the, the, the real meaning of this. He said that, that you avoid oppositions of science, 
falsely so-called. Now let me try to explain it to you real quick. Opposition just means opposing ideas. What is science? Actually, what does the word science mean? Knowledge. That's what the word science means is knowledge. And there's a lot of branches of science. So he said here that you avoid opposing ideas that are framed to be knowledge. That these people are coming out with these, these new ideas and they're claiming that it's the truth. It's, it's, it's fact. But notice how he, how he describes it. He said it's called that falsely. <laughs> That's what he means. Oppositions of science falsely so-called. He said it's not really knowledge. It's, uh, it's heresy. It's, it's untruth. He said you avoid these things. Then he said this in verse 21. Which some professing. There's some that profess to know the Lord, but he said that they have gotten caught up in these things, and they have erred concerning the faith. Remember the faith, the truth, the doctrine. He said, don't you get caught up in that. You keep that that's been committed to thy trust. You avoid all these things. Simple uh, salutation there at the end. He said, grace be with thee. Amen. He started the, the uh, epistle in, in chapter 1, verse 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now he finishes it with grace be with thee. What is it that was going to allow Timothy to be that man of God that he needed to be? It was God's grace. And so it's grace to start with. It's grace to end with. A wonderful advice that Paul gives uh, to Timothy. And I trust, I, have, I guess I've enjoyed studying this book as much as I've ever enjoyed studying one. I hope you've got something out of it. It's so practical to us. May we take heed to it. And uh, that we would, uh, I'm, let me just go back and write it. I wasn't going to go back and read this. But let, this is a good, good way to summarize the book. These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. That's what the book's all about. That we would know how to conduct ourselves in the church. Why? Why is that important? It's just a church. Just a church. It's the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And if the church is out of order, the truth is not going to be that light. It's going to be dim. It's not going to shine forth uh, as brightly as it ought to. So we'll ask for a verse of a song tonight. If there'd be anything on your heart, if you trusted Christ, you desire to follow him in baptism, any way the church is known to receive members, invitation.